Great, so I'm here with some certified master rental planners from some of our customers in the New York City area. I'm joined by Kyle Sikowski from NSTAR Group and Arjun Rai from ABM, both certified master rental planners and both kind of responsible for managing the models within, uh, within their companies. So we kind of wanted to get into some of the details of what does the day-to-day -day life look like of a certified master rental planner managing different parts of their rental plan footprint. So Kyle, why don't we start with you? Can you tell us a little bit about your Anaplan footprint, how you use Anaplan, and what things look like at NSTAR? Yes, uh, so I'm Kyle Sikowski. I work at NSTAR Group. We've been working with Anaplan for about three years now. We've uh, expanded to three models and uh, over three implementations. Our Anaplan footprint is uh, small, <laughs> so to say. We have about six users in Anaplan who are administrators and uh, only around uh, 70 to 80 users. Um, right now we're using it for uh, planning, allocations, and investments in compliance. And I, I, I believe we're in the infancy stages trying to expand. And my day-to-day -day, uh, my day -to -day Anaplan use is all around optimization, security, and enhancements and defects. Great, thank you. So hi everybody, my name's Arjun, I work for ABM, I've been there for almost two years now. I was brought on originally to do reporting and dashboarding uh, for some of our strategic initiatives in the company. Uh, and a plan fell in my lap and I've been working in it uh, ever since uh, to do labor reporting. Uh, we have about 140,000 employees and we've rolled out labor um, dashboarding and um, management tools for about, uh, I would say, 30 to 40,000 of those employees. So we wanted to kind of jump right in, having two certified master rental planners here. We wanted to get into the details, get a little nerdy, talk about some model building. So maybe we were hoping you could share some of your favorite model building tips, tricks, hacks that you're working on right now. Yeah, so my, my favorite uh, right now is actually based around security, and it's uh, all because of dynamic cell access. And uh, the reason why it's my favorite is because it saves me time. Just flipping back and forth between the user settings uh, became kind of frustrating. You know, going back in, we would shut down certain users to have read or write access based on the time of plan. And um, this became, you know, kind of a timely manner. And uh, we basically configured dynamic cell access around users and basically were able to switch a read and write function just by a click of a button. And we're using dynamic cell access for everything. You know, the different users are only allowed to see certain numbers. And you know, we're, we're able to do that all the way down to a specific account. So it helps me with security, just because I don't have to really work uh, or look into basically if all the roles are aligned. Right, right, and I'm sure that's much easier to manage in a production environment doing it from maybe a module instead of from the, the back end, the user exactly. settings. Exactly. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Arjun, what about your yeah, so in our labor report, our, one of the requirements that we had was to rank um, our projects um, top and bottom 10 uh, at different levels of hierarchy. With the normal rank formula, it's very hard to do that. Um, you can't get the, the look and the feel that what we would expect from for an end user. So I worked with our, our success manager here, uh, James O'Leary, uh, and he helped me sort of develop a couple of modules that did that. Uh, going into some of the technical pieces, we kind of converted everything from a number to a text. All the ranking that we did, we converted from a number to a text and concatenated uh, a certain level information on that on that text value. And then we sorted it and uh, sorted it that way. So ranking, you know, just using the numbers doesn't really give us the effect that we want. So now we can see the top and bottom 10 projects within a level of hierarchy without having to group them at the bottom or at the top of a, of a list. Yeah, and you're doing this across different levels and segments of a hierarchy, Correct, right? correct. Yeah, I think that's that's really exciting use case for you're using the rank function, you're concatenating things, and you're kind of... Right, it's th it's not the cleanest code, right? It's not the most efficient, so I don't know if it passed uh, a lot of Anaplan tests, but uh, <laughs> that that, uh, that trade-off between efficiency and uh, a good, a better user experience, I think, is worth it in this case. Yeah, and I think overall, b both of those are great examples of ways that you're able to manage and own your own Anaplan environment. Um, you can kind of stretch things out. Maybe that wouldn't have been one of your initial requirements for an implementation partner. Maybe you wouldn't have known that you were able to do it, but with just some help from your helpful customer success director, thank you, James O'Leary, uh, you're able to kind of own that and manage that on your own instead of being dependent on somebody else or having to wait for the end of an implementation cycle. 
So I think it's a great opportunity for you to really own the flexibility of what you're doing in Ataplan. And it brings me to another question that I'm curious about from both of your perspectives. Uh, I think you both work with implementation partners. You both have obviously relied on implementation partners to get where you are today, and you continue to use them despite being certified master Ana planners. So Arjun, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about um, how you work with implementation partners today moving forward as you continue expanding with Anaplan. Sure. They're involved in basically every aspect of the projects that we're working on, from um, the build, to requirements gathering, to documentation. So we rely on them pretty heavily to sort of not just help us organize our business processes, but also to sort of trouble, uh, not troubleshoot, but identify opportunities where we can do things better and maybe a little differently, especially when we move to Anaplan um, and when we use the, when we use the platform, what's easiest in the platform as well. Yeah, so kind of leaning on their business process expertise or the outside value they can add and um, showing you the, the art of what you can do with Anaplan. Is that kind of how you're, you're leaning on them? Yeah. I think that's, a, that's an interesting point around, you know, the long-term value of our partner ecosystem as a whole is that they kind of cover a broad, you know, all of our different customers, all the different kinds of use cases and can add a lot of value in that way. It's not just about building models for you or tweaking things after they right. go live. But they're also pretty good about looking at what we've already built and finding efficiencies within what we've already built in terms of, those, in terms of like reducing size of the models so we can fit more stuff in you know, and do more analytics. Yeah, that's great. And then Kyle, I know you also work with uh, an implementation partner. Yes, yes. So uh, at NSTAR, we've been working with Peloton for the last three years now, and we've done three implementations. And since I've become a master Ana planner, we've kind of transitioned to me becoming the main model builder and uh, Peloton just having a solution architect kind of just to drive uh, you know, the meetings and kind of have me just in the back, just making sure that I'm sitting through everything, going through all the requirements that our, uh, that our group wants. And you know, it helps on, on both ends because um, once we put the requirement trace, uh, the RTM in, mm -hmm. um, uh, me being a model builder, I'll be able to go back to Will and say, hey, you know, listen, we, we might have missed a few requirements. Can we revisit? Uh, you know, one, two, or three, and um, and just having me on uh, being the main model builder, it helps our group just because uh, you know uh, I think overall in cost, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also uh, like I said, you're you're in you're now fully um, you're fully in in uh, development of uh, a model from scratch, really. You know, so uh, our next two implementations, I will be the full model builder, and we'll be using Peloton just kind of oversee our. Uh, implementation yeah that's 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 great and I think I know you've developed a really strong relationship with them over those those years uh, you, you mentioned cost obviously prices is definitely a factor and I think what I've seen across a lot of our customers who have built COEs is that they're definitely changing how they spend money a lot of them are spending less money on implementation partners but there's also the the change in the value that you're getting from an implementation partner right and I think you both mentioned that in in, in different ways depending on the the size and the scope of your of your roadmap, there's this kind of higher value that you're getting from them instead of just building models, fixing things, making sure things are up and running, and you know keeping the training wheels on. To then branching out and saying, how can we optimize models? How can we improve business processes or providing solution architecture across many different use cases? I think that's the value that I see a lot of our customers getting as they build COEs, as they kind of invest in people becoming certified master Ana planners. And that's, I think that value adds a lot more than just the cost savings of an implementation partner. I'm not sure if you, if you agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I fully agree with that. You know, um, just having uh, the ability to um, have an in-house in expert helps so much, you know. Um, like you said, we, we only go to our um, consulting partners for any major issues that we have with our models. You know, I, I'm able to handle anything that uh, any, uh, you know, enhancements or defect requests from our stakeholders uh, on our own. And uh, it saves time just because you're going back and forth between consulting partners. And now it's just a quick email to your yeah. <laughs> the guy working next to you. So, so it definitely helps out in that uh, perspective. Yeah, and Arjun, are you kind of seeing the same? Yeah, well, I see the same thing. A lot of the feedback I get is it's nice to have somebody in-house that can answer questions more immediately as opposed to going outside and emailing somebody or setting up a call uh, to get an answer or get something kind of fixed or enhanced in the, in the model. Right, yeah. So I think there's definitely a, a role for both. 
And I think there's a lot of value that kind of having in-house expertise and strong partnerships with, uh, with some of our implementation partners, there's a lot that could be you know, gained across the ecosystem. But going, Kyle, going to one of your points about um, managing things as they're happening in production, I want to talk a little bit about the day-to-day -day after go live. What happens after the implementation is stood up? Uh, can you talk us through maybe how are you managing defects if they come up or enhancement requests? I know sometimes the business users don't necessarily see the difference between those two things. So just kind of one flood of questions yeah. coming your way. But how are you managing that today? Yeah, so um, that process has changed ever since, uh, you know, from our first implementation where I had to go in and kind of learn and a plan myself to now where I, I can go in and fix any issues just because I know the system better. You know, so, so how we kind of prioritize it is basically, uh, you know, we'll have either a defect or enhancement uh, request. And we'll put it in uh, basically uh, an RTM kind of format where like, you know, uh, all right, we need to get this done in order for XYZ project to be finished. So, so it's more of just like a prioritizing requests and then um, just kind of uh, <laughs> fixing them as they pop up, you know? Because some issues are just a quick issue, like uh, and a, a list may be missing a member, or you know, a subset's not uh, working because a process is missing a mapping. Mm -hmm. So those, those requests are easy to fix, but you know, when, when somebody brings in an enhancement, we kind of have to sit down and look at it uh, in, type, in, in the type of project scope. You know, what is needed? Do we need to allocate a number of hours just to fix this or, you know, enhance our model? So it, it, we kind of take it, um, you know, one step at a time where, you know, if somebody comes in and we can fix it right away, we go in and do it. But if not, then we like to sit down and scope it out. And that's, that's one thing that I've learned is don't, don't just dive into Anaplan <laughs> and just start, you know, just start making uh, changes because then you kind of lose, uh, you know, lose where you are. I, I've, I've become uh, very good at kind of whiteboarding, mm -hmm. and that's uh, I know I've learned that actually from Anaplan. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's helped me out in how I make changes within our model, and it, it's been uh, extremely beneficial. Yeah, taking that step back and saying not just what settings on an import do I need to change, but what am I overall trying to accomplish? How would I approach this regardless of an Anaplan configuration and kind of drawing it out first? And that's something that David Smith talks a lot about when he talks about model optimization is uh, can you solve the problem without actually opening Anaplan and then implementing the solution that you've kind of thought up? And obviously things always go a little bit differently in real life, but kind of thinking things through before you do them just because it's, just because it's easy to build it in Anaplan doesn't mean that's the right right way to solve it. Yeah. Um, Arjun, what about on, on your end? How are you managing? I know you have a much broader user base, many, yeah. uh, many so different use cases. Right, so we have about 500 users um, in, our, in our models right now. Originally, when we went live with some of them, we had a more official sort of process through a SharePoint site. So they would put their feedback in there, whether it's an enhancement request or a bug, they would uh, submit it through there, and then the team would kind of review them and say and prioritize which ones need to be done. On the project that I worked on, on the labor side, we did a similar sort of thing, especially at the beginning of the rollout, uh, because that's when you would get the most you know, feedback, right? As people are just starting to get used to the system, they'll notice a lot more of the bugs and enhancements that need to be made. But now that it's sort of quieted down a little bit, uh, we've done our, we've rolled it out to basically our largest visit segment. So now that feedback has quieted down, so it's a little bit more relaxed now. I, I basically rely on our business lead to kind of collect all that information um, because he's, he's the one that's closest to the business to be able to collect that. Uh, and then he feeds it to me and then I prioritize um, on my side what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done. Got it. What does your what what would you say your backlog looks like these days? Uh, these days, it's it's not heavy. Um, there are some things that we're working on. We're trying to use the new UX and uh, and and maybe deploy some mobile dashboards for our team. So that's on our roadmap uh, of to dos. Um, but in terms of major enhancements, there's not a lot happening in terms of major enhancements. We do have a, a next phase of projects that are coming out, which we don't get to some of this backlog now, we get to it in that in that project. Sure, sure, yeah, it sounds like you've been able to move more from reactive to being more proactive. It's not like you're slowing down with Anaplan, it's that you're not putting out fires so much anymore. Right, and, and we're trying to enhance it uh, constantly, so we show the value of Anaplan, um, and also to help our field operators manage their business more effectively. Yeah, and I, I mean, one of the things that we all know is end users looking at an Anaplan dashboard will have a million ideas of what they think should happen. And you're right, usually around UAT or around go live, um, you're 
probably flooded with, with those types of requests. Um, and the more proactive you can be to kind of manage those and manage expectations and deliver value proactively instead of waiting for the business to come to you, the more kind Right, of and our business is very diverse, even though we're a, um, sort of a maintenance service sort of company. The feedback that we get is a little bit more of that customization of how they need the, the tool to work to manage their business. Right, so that, that tweaking the business processes to each individual set of groups instead of that this doesn't work for me or this right. isn't. <laughs> and that's where our implementation partner kind of comes in because they, they help us with tracking uh, the entire process across the organization and then we work with them to kind of say, okay, this is the commonalities between the different business segments, these are the differences and how can we, can, how can we build our Anaplan project you know, around, around that. Yeah, that's great. And Kyle, I know you had a very large backlog, one of the <laughs> first times we talked, and I, I think that you've been kind of chipping away at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so, uh, you know, just to piggyback off what Arjun's saying, you know, our backlog is, you know, it, it's, like you said, it, it downsized tremendously, you know. We, we were able over the last two years to kind of attack any enhancements or, you know, defects that uh, stakeholders saw. And uh, it, it, it just comes back to how, how we kind of handle things now, and you know, whether prioritizing what needs to be fixed and what needs to be added in for stakeholders to get the most out of uh, Anaplan. And you know, now it's just more of uh, enhancements and customization around uh, different regions and regional CFOs or you know, uh, stakeholders and how they want to use Anaplan. So that's, that's now what we're, we're finally on. Yeah, and that's, that's not a, do you see that as being part of a project implementation phase, or do you see this as just kind of an agile series of releases that are happening? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but for us, it's more of just like an agile phase. You know, it's just them coming back, and uh, it's it's interesting because a lot of a lot of people like to use Excel and, and bring everything into Excel. Where uh, you know, just recently we had a regional CFO come to me and say, hey, you know, uh, we have this Excel workbook that we use, and I look at it, and sure enough, it looks exactly like a dashboard that we could create in Anaplan. <laughs> so next thing you know, I'm like, all right, give me you know, 15, 20 minutes, and sure enough, we have all the reports already made. We post it in there, and next thing you know, all our regional CFOs are now using it. So it, it's we're onto that phase where a lot of stakeholders don't really know what Anaplan can truly do. Right. And when, when we ask them to kind of show us examples, I'd kind of just run with it and say, hey, all right, hey, listen, now it's an Anaplan. Let me know if, uh, if you guys need anything else. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's a really inspiring story. I think that's something that a lot of our more mature customers are getting to, and a lot of our newer customers are hopeful that they can, they can get there. So it's always nice to hear yeah. <laughs> stories yeah. like that. Arjun, I know you have a similar story, and you also have a great executive sponsor, a series of executive sponsors who are kind of championing Anaplan. So it's not just a, a grassroots kind of in Kyle's case, it's not just a ground up, it's also coming from top down. Right, I mean, initially it started more grassroots, but um, uh, nowadays when, when I put the dashboards in front of our leadership, they see the benefit. Even more so our field operators see the benefit. The feedback I've gotten on a lot of the labor reporting that we've built is that this will really help us manage our business much better. Mm -hmm. you know? So there's a lot of efficiencies there and it provides our, our field operators a one-stop shop for you know, all the data points that they kind of need from labor dollars, hours, rates, you know, to, to the individual timesheet details. They can go through their level of the hierarchy um, for, their, for their specific set of business and manage labor more effectively. And again, like I was saying before, with the new UX, it might have, have happened more real time you know, uh, as we as we put those dashboards in front of them, but our, our leadership has been very supportive um, of of the of, of the tool. You know, we've invested pretty pretty significantly in it. So, <coughs> so I think uh, it the supports over there. So, and as as we move forward, we'll have a more official sort of COE that's kind of in the stages of being you know talked about and developed. Hmm. Well, I think, and you bring up a really good point about your end users using the, the tool or the dashboards that you're building. And you talked about it as managing my business. And I think that's a, a critical piece. We're, we're kind of moving beyond just planning or maybe an annual plan or a quarterly planning cycle to how do I manage my business every day? And when you can kind of deliver that value to your end users, that's a different kind of value than just the, you move planning from a spreadsheet into Anaplan, but I can manage my business more effectively Right. now that I'm using this tool. We do have also that planning piece where we do our finance and uh, uh, our yearly budgeting and uh, forecasting in Anaplan itself. 
Uh, but one of the pieces of feedback I've gotten from my CFO is, you put this dashboard in front of me, now what do I do with mm -hmm. it? Who do I go to to, an to ask these questions of? In our old world, before Anaplan, that was a lot harder to sort of answer. But now with Anaplan, since you can go from top to bottom in our hierarchy, it's a lot easier to answer because you can see the different levels uh, and how they're performing. Yeah. And so going to your, your point around your the executive buy-in that you have, how do you think that has helped maybe your day-to-day -day life or your management of the Anaplan footprint? H what are some ways that you see that executive buy-in um, impacting the, you know, the Anaplan team or the Anaplan footprint? Well, I think the support will help us grow Anaplan in our organization. We do have, like I said before, um, people that are enabled in Anaplan, but there's not anybody that's really fully dedicated to it, maybe except for one or two people at this point. And so as we build that momentum, we, we move that boulder slowly and slowly, and then now, um, as we show the benefit of it, it's going to kind of start rolling a little quicker. Yeah, I think the, the momentum, um, agility, maybe the, the ability to react to things more quickly. Those are some of the benefits I see of executive sponsorship. But I know that you, you've kind of got great visionary leadership who understand the potential of what Anaplan can do and kind of having that come from the top, I mean, must be a... <laughs> yeah, no, it, it helps out a lot. And it's, it's nice to be associated with, uh, uh, you know, a platform that's successful at our mm. company, you know, and has a lot of visibility right now. Yes, that's great for you personally, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kyle, I know it's also great for you personally. Um, what does it look like? I know you've had um, really strong leadership, really, who understood the potential of Anaplan. How has that played out for you, or has, how has that helped you in your role? Yeah, no, um, you know, it's, it's having a leadership team behind you, uh, it, it helps a lot, because I think the, the biggest issue um, implementing a new software is uh, basically getting others to change, you know, and... and and I, I know I'll touch, I touched on this earlier, how everybody wants to go and excel. You know, having a leadership team behind you to fully support Anaplan, they, they kind of get the initiative to just say, get all the other stakeholders on board to say, all right, hey, you got to go do all your reporting in Anaplan. And, and having our team, uh, having our leadership team around uh, basically doing that has been extremely helpful for me just because now I'm not, you know, handling ton of different worksheets, spreadsheets uh, being sent my, uh, to my desk. But now what's, uh, now what's going on is um, basically our leadership team has saw the benefits of Anaplan, and now they want to add in the operational metrics and basically have the executive management team all operate on Anaplan as well. So, th so it's, it's been extremely beneficial to our team. And, and I've, uh, I've loved it just because, you know, <laughs> now I have the, the one-stop shop, like you said, that everyone is using. Yeah, and that exposure. So now you have direct exposure to some of your, your leadership that exactly. maybe at other points in your career you wouldn't have had quite right. so And so as, we use, as we think of different use cases now, that it becomes easier to sell that um, up the chain you know, because they've seen the benefit on one side. So they, now they'll say, okay, if you want to maybe get involved with the sales process, you, know, you can do that right? because now we have that support from top down. So it's, yeah, it's opening up doors for you as you're, as you're going. Um, Kyle, you mentioned... Uh, showing kind of how you were showing value to the business. So how, wh what are some ways that you think you built some of that executive sponsorship way, way, way back? <laughs> how do you think you got there to that point? Um, I mean, it, it, it wasn't all me, you know, it, it was, I was kind of the brains around uh, <laughs> building, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I, I was kind of directed by my team members to kind of say, all right, hey, listen, we, we would like to put um, a CFO dashboard or a COO dashboard and, um, and basically, even our COO one time came by and said, you know, we would like to see some HR um, metrics and basically have an HR model. So, so we kind of uh, took these requests and uh, basically built out different, um, different reports or different, you know, uh, operational metrics that they would like to see. So, for instance, like a turnover rate with the HR. So, so we were able to put together basically a whole HR model and kind of, di we, we displayed it to them, uh, you know, just walked them through, all right, hey, this is what we envision. And they came back and they were still kind of on Excel. So we, we're, we're still button heads right now, but we have the ability to move them to, um, to Anaplan and hopefully, uh, hopefully we get them. Yeah. <laughs> but. Well, it sounds like for both of you, this wasn't a case of putting together slides or proposing a business value justification. Uh, probably at first there was some of that, but now it's more of just showing people what you've built or building things that help make people's jobs better, whether it takes 15 minutes or whether it took a week or a month. Um, and then showing that that value 
directly to end users has kind of been the biggest way of selling at a plan internally. Right. Would and the other piece agree? of feedback I get from our operators is, you know, because it's a better product and a, it help, it's a better process than what they had before, they're much more easy to adopt it, you know, than their Excel format that, they, that they're used to. Yeah. Yeah, and then I know for our case, uh, I don't know how you guys use them, but we do actual reporting. And uh, we were able to use uh, Anaplan Connect to basically uh, have a, f you know, a, a daily update, uh, basically, of our Coda Actual. So basically, all the reports are all on, you know, real time across all regions. So that's, that's shown a, a help, at least for reporting aspect, just because now, instead of sending an Excel file over to the EU team, the, that it's pulling a you know, completely different uh, Coda set, you know. And now we're all using the same numbers. So, so that's, that's been helpful uh, in our organization, at least, just for the actual side of reporting.